All right, welcome everyone to our monthly Midrick uh, seminar. Uh, today's speaker will be Dr. Ravi Maduri from Oregon National Lab. But before uh, I start introducing the speaker, let's uh, go over some housekeeping. Uh, after the presentation, there will be a, a, a live question and answer session. So please feel free to, during the presentation, type your uh, questions into the Q&A box and then Ravi will get to them after his presentation. So Dr. Ravi Maduri is a computer scientist working in the intersection of high performance computing and AI and biomedicine. His research interests are in building sustainable, scalable services for science, reproducible research, large scale data management, analysis using high performance computing and AI. He leads the Pellicide X project that is developing privacy preserving federated learning framework to build robust, trustworthy AI models. And he is part of the Midric project where he contributes to the collaborative research project number 10. He co-leads the MVP champion project, which is a collaboration between the, uh, Veterans Affairs and the Department of Energy and develops methods to perform large scale genetic data analysis using DOE's high performance computing capabilities, including for prostate cancer and genome-wide VOS uh, analysis. For his efforts in project management, tool development, and collaboration, he has received several outstanding achievement awards from the NIH. Also for his works on the Cancer Moonshot Project, he received the Department of Energy Secretary Award in 2017. Um, so this will, promises to be a very uh, exciting uh, seminar on federated learning. And Ravi, please take it away. Uh, thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, let me uh, quickly share my screen um, and get, um, okay. Uh, hopefully you all can see my screen. Um, so I'm, going to talk about uh, some of the work that we've been doing in developing the advanced uh, privacy preserving federated learning framework at Oregon, U Chicago and elsewhere. Um, and um, I'm, I'm really, I, I wanna make sure that, you know, uh, uh, that I convey the excitement that I feel while, while working on this to you all, uh, as this is an important capability um, that um, will allow us to build uh, robust and trustworthy AI models. Um, especially uh, one thing I, before I begin, I have to acknowledge uh, the uh, uh, the lessons I learned working closely with this group um, and especially in applying and developing AI for, for medical images, um, things that I've learned, I, I'll cover them as I go through my presentation. Um, this work, that I'm presenting is uh, it's supported by uh, a grant from Department of Energy, uh, especially the Office of Advanced Scientific and Computing uh, Research, Oscar, uh, in Department of Energy. Um, and participants in this uh, in this work were also funded by Midric um, under the under the following contract. Um, as with a lot of uh, um, uh, great work, uh, this. Um, uh, so I'm gonna. This is uh, 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 the outline I'm going to use to uh, to to present this uh, capability that we've been developing. Um, first and foremost, uh, I'll talk. I'll I'll show you um, the team that is behind this work uh, and um, the motivation for why we we started working on federated learning and why privacy preserving is an important aspect of this this work. Um, and talk about the capabilities that we developed as part of this project and in collaboration with the, with the Midric community. Um, mostly I'll talk about the architecture decisions that we've taken uh, to ensure that um, the different modules of our software uh, could be interchanged or, or um, could so new capabilities can be added. Uh, so mostly I'll, I'll emphasize the, the composability um, and the extensibility of the framework and the APIs that we built uh, while while creating these capabilities. Uh, I'll present a few slides um, on um, applying this capability to biomedical applications. Uh, we have other domains 
uh, where we also work in, uh, where we apply federated learning. But uh, my um, my emphasis and my focus is um, applying federated learning for developing robust and trustworthy AI models in biomedicine. Uh, so I'm going to talk uh, a bit about some of the applications that we developed, and um, and I'll end with uh, with kind of talking. Um, about why federated learning is important, uh, especially in the context of MIDRIC, um, and also in the context of what would it take to build a secure federated medical image data platform um, that, uh, that leverages some of the capabilities that uh, we are developing on the MIDRIC platform, especially the Gen3 Data Commons uh, framework, um, so that we can kind of um, uh, emphasize um, or, or uh, outline uh, the the key components, uh, the key technical components that could uh, that could be leveraged to build a powerful uh, data platform that would allow researchers and agencies to um, to develop uh, uh, robust and trustworthy AI models. Um, not only with publicly available data, but also use uh, private and sensitive uh, private data to uh, kind of create a, a unifo uh, uniform, unified uh, validation framework um, that has a low barrier to entry. Um, so as with a lot of things we do, um, this is not a one-man project. Um, there are many, many folks who were involved in this project uh, and helped us build this capability. Uh, we have a multidisciplinary team of uh, researchers who are computational experts, who are biomedical imaging experts, uh, who are AI experts, high-performance computational experts. Um, what I don't have on my slides are uh, people who we collaborate with in cybersecurity uh, who are an integral part of any any enterprise solution that you build. Um, if you don't uh, pass the muster of cybersecurity folks or the network security folks, it's oftentimes hard to uh, create a, a multi-organizational collaboration um, that that is uh, developing uh, AI models using private data. Uh, so. Uh, Kyle Halliday and Megan from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and cybersecurity folks, folks at Oregon have really helped us understand uh, some of the some of the challenges that uh, that we need to overcome in order for us to um, to develop a, a framework that will uh, uh, that will enable creating robust and trustworthy AI models on 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 private data. So let me just uh, begin with with a high level uh, uh, list of challenges that are unique to uh, developing AI models in in biomedical context. Um, as as you already know, uh, AI is a data hungry sport, right? The more data you have, the better uh, the models are. It's not just the quantity of the data; it also uh, you know, it also refers to the distribution of the data. Um, you really want to have data that kind of covers the uh, the spectrum or the 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 kind of the domain in which you are training the AI models. And you know, this concept gets a little trickier when you talk about transfer learning and other advanced AI concepts. But at a high level, uh, the more data you have, the better uh, uh, performing your models are. Uh, on in in the most general sense, um, but also uh, AI is a garbage in garbage out uh, uh, mechanism. Uh, so if you if you have uh, really data that only covers a, a tiny spectrum of your domain, um, you know chances are um, it won't work well in 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 a in a in a in a situation where uh, the distribution of data is different from the data that you are training you are training your model on. Um, as you already all know, uh, data in biomedicine, uh, uh, a significant amount of data in biomedicine is private and sensitive and comes in different modalities and um, with different distributions um, uh, where the, that, uh, that, that um, 
makes biomedicine one of the um, uh, one of the most interesting spaces in which AI could uh, uh, could actually make a difference. Um, also in biomedicine, you'll hear an alphabet soup of uh, requirements uh, from a compliance perspective, um, which go from FISMA, covered entities, HIPAA, DUAs, IRBs. All in all, I mean, these are all uh, important guardrails that uh, that are set up so that um, the research we do, the research that gets performed um, is fair, trustworthy, and uh, has a very little bias uh, in in the in the in the research. Um, so what that does is um, the the kind of the non technical policy challenges of the data availability uh, um, lends uh, itself to uh, models that get created in this space to be uh, a bit under specified and overfitted to the data that is available. So the these challenges, these kind of policy challenges, often result in um, making you know more or less less data available to building these AI models uh, for for biomedicine, and and it also leads to this this phenomenon um, that is very common for statisticians, uh, but uh, not very well appreciated uh, in, for people for practitioners of AI. Um, is this data set shift? Um, essentially, uh, it's a well-known uh, phenomenon. If you're if you're using um, if you're uh, if you're trying to adopt AI to a real-world situation uh, where the distribution of the data doesn't uh, doesn't look like the distribution of the data that was used in training, models often underperform. And um, you know, a couple of examples that come to my mind. One is this uh, sepsis. Uh, prediction tool, <laughs> excuse me, uh, sepsis prediction tool that uh, is uh, uh, included in the EPIC and other electronic health record systems that uh, didn't really perform well at the onset of COVID because uh, this model uh, hasn't been updated uh, to take into account uh, some of the emerging trends, um, emerging symptomatology for patients suffer that suffer from COVID uh, and they kind of overlap with how sepsis is originated. And as you all already know, sepsis is a serious problem and uh, it requires um, a physician to uh, to pay attention to it within 24 hours of its development. So um, so needless to say, um, you know, this model underperforming um, or not getting um, the, the latest and greatest uh, 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 symptomatology training uh, is is a is a is a problematic situation. Um, the other example that I don't have a slide for, maybe I should probably think about making a slide for this. Also, is this um, so one of the um, uh, uh, landmark papers that uh, that uh, showcase the utility of AI in biomedicine is the paper from Google that used uh, retina images to. Uh, to predict uh, diabetes retinopathy, um, and and the models have gotten very very accurate, and it resulted in a Nature paper. Um, and but uh, uh, subsequently, this was done a few years ago. Subsequently, they took the model that is uh, created in the U.S. and tried to make it, uh, try to use it um, in uh, in Southeast Asia, in Vietnam and India. And the model performance hasn't been hasn't been great, mostly because of various things. The data that uh, that the model is trained on uh, the, uh, looked a lot different from the data that the model is being used on. Um, so as as this kind of motivates for uh, the situation, kind of motivates for two things. One is you want to make sure that the the models you're creating that that you're training. Um, can see or be trained on um, data distributions that uh, uh, many, many different types of data distributions. Um, and also you, you want to make sure that um, the models um, are continuously updated. Uh, they're, not a, they're not static entities, so they need to be updated. Uh, so it also makes a case for model governance and model um, refresh, uh, for lack of a better word. 
so one one solution that we 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 thought would work and and it has shown some promise is is using federated learning uh, to uh, uh, to build these models. Uh, the solution is essentially tries to address the first part of the problem that I talked about, which is uh, enabling the model to ship to be able to train on multiple data sets uh, or or data sets in multiple locations. Um, because federated learning is is effective because um, um, you know in biomedicine, as I mentioned before, data is often uh, siloed and private, so we want to sort of uh, use uh, use an, a paradigm where we don't collect all the data in in central in one central location. We send models to where data is instead of trying to get uh, uh, data where the uh, where the models could be trained on. Um, so the idea, the the basic idea in federated learning is pretty simple. Um, it's essentially using machine learning without centrally storing trained data. There's no direct data sharing or, or storing. Um, the, there's a central server uh, in the, so there are many varieties of federated learning. And uh, in this talk, I'm going to talk about uh, synchronous federated learning where there's a, a server um, that is uh, centrally located and it is uh, transferring or, uh, or uh, sending models to a, uh, to a client or a user location and essentially uh, learning a global model uh, by uh, by aggregating the weights that each site is generating uh, from the local training. Um, so essentially, uh, federated learning is where um, you know you um, you train locally, you share gradients to a, a centralized location. The central location aggregates the model weights across all of the clients, creates a global shared model, and train and sends it back to the to the sites. So there are two, two um, uh, uh, settings in which federated learning is often used. One is a cross-device federated learning, which is essentially what is driving um, your phones to auto-complete your, your text messages for you. Uh, so when, when you type a text message to somebody on your phone, um, it is predicting the next word uh, by federated learning. A, a model is learning on your device uh, to predict the next word in your text message. In this in this particular uh, talk, I'm going to talk about the cross silo federated learning, in which there are a few large data repositories, and we are we are trying to train a model across these data repositories. Um, for example, you know, Midric could be uh, one of the large data repositories. There could be uh, other uh, repositories in other countries where you want to uh, train a model using data across all of these uh, uh, data repositories. So uh, the the challenge uh, here is uh, in in the in case of federated learning is that um, how do you aggregate weights? How do you um, uh, how do you kind of give uh, uh, preference to some sites? So there's there are a lot of computational challenges, a lot of algorithmic challenges. Um, that uh, we uh, we ended up uh, looking into and made good progress on developing solutions for this for these challenges. Um, as I mentioned before, um, the data in biomedicine is often private, and uh, regular federated learning uh, uh, on uh, m might not work for for uh, all the data modalities that we see in biology and biomedicine. So uh, you really want to add privacy preserving techniques to this federated learning. Uh, so we experimented with uh, with a few. There are, there's, uh, there are privacy preserving federated learning. Uh, there are some techniques in, uh, in uh, preserving privacy. Homomorphic encryption is one of them. Secure multi-party computation is one of them. And differential privacy is another one. Uh, so we evaluated all of these approaches to, uh, to, um, to preserve privacy when you're doing federated learning. And you know, secure multi-party computation uh, is prohibitively computationally expensive. Homomorphic encryption didn't work in all the use cases we had. Differential privacy does provide a nice balance between um, between computational expensiveness uh, to the ac uh, to the um, uh, to the application of uh, biomedical data sets. So uh, so we ended up uh, leveraging uh, privacy preserving techniques uh, from differential privacy uh, perspective 
uh, where we we kind of use a randomized function uh, to um, to add noise to the to the gradients and use uh, and use these uh, gradients to uh, to create a global global model. So uh, we ended up creating a software. Uh, a toolkit called uh, Advanced Privacy Preserving Federated Learning Framework because we are really bad at naming things. Uh, uh, we literally took what we're doing and added an advance to it, uh, called it AFL. Um, so the idea here is that you have a central server um, and the server is uh, uses an initial model, uh, sends it to all the clients in the federation uh, so you create a federation, um, you have a global model, a pre-trained model, and you essentially send the model to all the local clients. Um, these clients could be running different computational infrastructures. So we, we enabled our capabilities so that it can work with different heterogeneous computing capabilities so that uh, you don't have to write code on how to train on different computational elements. Um, and uh, it aggregates uh, the the weights uh, for every epoch. Uh, you uh, the server receives a an updated model from all the clients, aggregates the weights, sends the model back to each client, and then it continues until the model uh, converges. Um, so it's it's a rather simple distributed computing slash distributed learning uh, capability with an added twist that uh, all of these weights are are use differential privacy. And and are and are private in nature, so um, they prevent um, uh, model inversion attacks where a malevolent server or a client can uh, reconstruct sensitive data from model gradients. Uh, because we use privacy-preserving algorithms, um, this is not possible um, uh, for for a for a malevolent user. Um, so we uh, we implemented AFL. Uh, with a very uh, um, uh, with a uh, the framework uh, with a very uh, uh, deliberate uh, design uh, where we all the components are pluggable. Uh, we have a very um, uh, flexible architecture that allows you to add different training algorithms, um, different privacy preserving schemes. We support different communication protocols uh, that allow you to set up federations. Within an organization, within um, uh, with across different organizations, uh, so that uh, you can um, uh, so within an organization, for example, if you have a supercomputer, which we do at Argon uh, and in Department of Energy, we use MPI, which is an efficient communication, and that allows us to do federated learning across multiple supercomputers uh, in in a much uh, robust and uh, and uh, an efficient manner. Uh, we built our framework on top of PyTorch, uh, which kind of made sense, and it and it was a good decision that we took a couple of years ago uh, when we started this, uh, because PyTorch um, has very low barrier to entry, and a lot of our graduate students and and our software developers uh, um, are very much familiar with PyTorch, and 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 it also helped us uh, build a community of contributors, uh, open source contributors that have taken our framework. And kept adding new capabilities to it without uh, without our, us um, supporting them as much. So um, the the idea is that we have different um, uh, technical components that could be swapped in and out as needed. Um, we also added a bunch of uh, compression algorithms so that uh, you can uh, you can increase the efficiency in which the models are are getting transferred from the client to server. Um, so it's a very um, pluggable architecture that allows you to run these uh, federated learning experiments uh, across organizations uh, very easily. But the challenge with this approach uh, uh, with, uh, with creating just the framework uh, is that uh, it almost, it, I mean, it does require an advanced computer science degree to set it up and make it right. Um, the other challenge is not only that it is tedious to set up these experiments, it also doesn't guarantee end-to-end -end security. Uh, when I say end-to-end -end security, what I mean by that is, um, um, let's say you have user A from University of Chicago, user B from uh, Broad Institute, um, and user C from 
um, uh, from uh, um, Northwestern University. Uh, who, so in order to create a secure end-to-end -end federation, uh, there needs to be some assertions on identity management. Uh, how do we know that, um, how does a server trust a client that is uh, sending its weights from Northwestern is in fact the, 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 the user that you, are, uh, you have a secure trusted relationship with. So establishing trust relationships in federation, uh, in a federated learning environment is very important. Uh, it's also important to have privacy preserving capabilities um, to, so that a, a, a bad user or a bad actor cannot uh, uh, compromise the overall security of the system. So the challenges in this, uh, in using uh, the AFL framework to, to run federated learning experiments is that when you're talking about federated learning, you have heterogeneous computing resources with different schedulers and policies. Uh, the end-to-end -end security setup is often onerous uh, because there's no uniform authentication authorization frameworks. And this is where uh, something like Gen3 Data Commons framework comes in very handy because it does sort of provide uh, a, a, uh, a uniform authentication authorization framework uh, that allows us to set up secure federations across multiple organizations. So um, most of the uh, so most of the existing federated learning frameworks implement role-based access control using self-signed certificates and policy servers, which is uh, which is great if you're uh, familiar with how to set it up. But in our experience, a lot of domain scientists kind of um, don't really have the expertise and, and uh, setting up these uh, uh, secure frameworks is often very onerous and uh, they can easily go wrong. And, and uh, most of these frameworks have a lot of configuration files that you need to know exactly what you're doing. And um, um, as you know, uh, increasing, increasingly the model sizes are becoming larger. And um, these often lead to communication overheads in federated learning. So uh, we had very good uh, experience using compression uh, frameworks in our federated learning so that uh, you could train at a much faster rate. Um, Multi-model models especially uh, take a longer time to converge because of these communication overheads, which we try to, which we uh, address by uh, by creating compression uh, compression uh, algorithms um, and and using efficient uh, wide area network uh, uh, communication protocols, so our solution to fix this um, to lower the barrier to entry, to make it easy for domain scientists to to create and run federations and experiment with uh, AI models in the hope to create um, uh, most more robust and trustworthy AI models is to make a service that will allow you to create federated learning experiments easily. Um, so you, in, in the same way that we created AFL, we made this into a very, uh, the architecture of this uh, framework is, is very uh, extensible and pluggable. So um, essentially we have identified these components that, uh, that will provide uh, um, authentication capabilities, authorization capabilities, and allow us to create end-to-end -end secure federations. And um, uh, this website allows you to design uh, the uh, design different experiments with different participants in the federation and be able to visualize the results, uh, be able to run experiments, visualize the results um, from, uh, in terms of model performance, um, and uh, using TensorBoard uh, to see how your model is performing um, when you're training it on multiple data sets across multiple organizations. So um, one of the important advantages that we have with this, with this capability is that we can plug into any uh, security provider uh, that, is conform that conforms to a web standard called OpenID and OAuth2 uh, so like, for example, if you're at Northwestern or University of Chicago, uh, we use uh, something called Okta or Dual. Uh, so we can easily plug into those, uh, those frameworks to create a, an identity and access management capability that allows you to set up secure federations, not only within organizations, but also across multiple organizations. Um, so the key capabilities for this framework are 
it's very simple to use uh, and user experiences uh, makes it easy to understand the hyperparameters that you can set. Um, we implemented a lot of fair ideas into uh, in, in building. So um, essentially all the models have unique identifiers. Uh, we caught, we we remember we have a database uh, that where we store all the metadata about the experiments uh, and allows you to rerun them to see uh, if you're getting the same results. Uh, we are added a lot of visualizations to to see data distributions across multiple sites um, because we use end-to-end -end strong identity and access management. It allows you to set up secure federations that cross organizational boundaries. Um, again. Uh, the important, so we also integrated with um, uh, Hugging Face uh, so that you can use Hugging Face APIs to get pre-trained models. Um, we integrate with GitHub uh, so that organizations can standardize on pre-processing data before they are trained on, on, on their respective sites. Um, one of the important things that we did that, uh, that makes this uh, much more powerful is we have APIs for this service that that allow you to integrate this capability into your your technologies, uh, so that you don't have to. Um, uh, so it becomes very uh, plug and play, um, so that you can set up secure federations um, integrated within your applications uh, easily. And uh, the reason, and this these kind of APIs allow you to. Um, uh, essentially integrate very well into Gen3 uh, and allow you to uh, work across multiple data commons, uh, common sets, I guess. I don't know what the plural of data commons is. Um, but uh, uh, essentially the, the power of API allows you to do a lot of this integration. Um, and I talked a bunch about this already, so I'll, I'm gonna skip a little bit um, in the interest of time. Uh, essentially why, as a service makes sense. Uh, the service thing makes sense because it lowers the barrier to entry for domain scientists and be able, and enable them to focus on creating experiments and allow them to focus on creating AI models that are more trustworthy instead of trying to figure out all the details that require you to uh, create these secure federations. Um, so uh, it, it kind of abstracts out a lot of the uh, undifferentiated lifting that researchers have to do in creating these trustworthy AI models. So let me quickly go through uh, some applications of uh, AFL in biomedicine. Um, as, um, as is common, uh, detection of COVID has become the hello world of uh, AI models in biomedicine. So we uh, we work with Midric uh, and re researchers from Midric and, uh, and elsewhere on on using federated learning to detect uh, COVID nineteen from chest X rays. Uh, we also have another experiment where we try to predict the age of uh, patients from ECG uh, and use those uh, those predicted ages for predicting risk for a cardiovascular event. Um, so. In our collaboration, uh, in applying AFL to uh, using uh, on using chest X-rays for predicting COVID nineteen, um, our experiments have uh, included three sites. Uh, we developed a, a a model using publicly available data, and then use these three sites to fine tune that model and learn from. Uh, from data across these three sites, uh, where the goal is to predict the chest X uh, COVID nineteen from these chest X rays, um, and we also use this uh, uh, use case to demonstrate the privacy preservation aspects. Uh, especially when you use stronger privacy, um, you uh, it becomes impossible for um, uh, anybody to regenerate or recreate training data. Um, so we were able to demonstrate the strong privacy and effects of strong privacy uh, budget on this use case. And also we, we were able to demonstrate that uh, when, 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 we let, when we use federated learning, the models that, that are trained um, became more robust uh, to data shift. Um, and also uh, the accuracy of the models increased um, and the robustness increased uh, when, uh, when, used, uh, when we, uh, when we uh, uh, used federated learning to train these models. Um, the second use case is ECG one, where um, again, um, uh, the, the basic idea here is that 
chronological age can be a poor predictor of lifetime CVD risk, especially for younger people. Um, so we try to predict age from ECGs and use that age uh, for calculating uh, a risk for a, for a cardiovascular event. Um, and um, we, we actually were pretty surprised, I mean, to see that um, the, the age predicted from ECG uh, has a better um, uh, has a, is better indicator for uh, for a cardiovascular event than uh, than the than a regular um, than the biological age and it's uh, and we used the PhysioNet data to to create the initial model which is publicly available and then um, fine tuned or trained it in a federated learning setting um, from um, UK Biobank data and also. Uh, from uh, from you know, uh, from Boston um, from Mass General Hospital, um, so this is uh, the performance that that we received. Uh, that uh, so overall, the um, the federated learning model uh, improves uh, uh, performed better on the on the data sets from uh, from PhysioNet and Broad after we used uh, federated learning to to create a a, a better uh, model from from this data. So let me. Uh, I know I'm. I'm sort of maybe I. I don't have a lot of time, but uh, but I, I. just want you to. I just want to take you on a journey on um, what would it take to uh, to develop a, a secure federated marketplace uh, for medical images that uh, that takes advantage of um, existing investments in Midric and and this uh, federated learning as a service that we developed. Um, so this is so I, uh, I I just wanted to uh, describe the motivation why I want to talk about this. I recently attended a, a seminar from ARPA Edge uh, that talked about creating a marketplace. Uh, the idea is um, is to uh, you know uh, accelerate the the certification process um, by uh, for of software as a medical device by removing barriers to obtain uh, um, high quality data. Ensuring that the mar so these are some of the requirements that um, that um, ARPA H has outlined, and I, I believe that uh, you know be, uh, um, um, with uh, Midric and uh, and FLX, uh, we can actually uh, create a, a a very robust and uh, convincing marketplace that would allow uh, these objectives to be achieved. Um, as you know, Midric uh, is a pretty um, large publicly available centralized database. So why do we need federated learning? Um, so the idea here is that we leverage the data from Midric to build a, so Midric becomes uh, an equivalent of ImageNet for medical images and where you develop initial models or, and then um, and then you create secure federations uh, to um, fine tune the models that are generated using Midric data uh, to uh, data sets across multiple organizations. So um, this is how we would improve the robustness and generalizability of these models. Um, so by utilizing the federated learning, uh, you, can, you can measure the generalizability uh, on the robustness of this model across different data set, different uh, organizations. Uh, we can also use federated learning to measure the quality of data um, just by using the model performance as a proxy for, for the quality of data. It will also help us identify any outliers. Uh, if you are implementing a continuous training framework, let's say organization A has uh, uploaded data sets or has data set that is out of distribution, um, the continuous training framework in a federated setting can quickly point out by, by showcasing the decrease uh, reduction in model performance uh, when 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 doing this, um, so um, again, you know, uh, at some level, the idea here is that a uh, uh, with with uh, federated learning and and um, um, and midric, we can we can reason why a a model that is just trained on midric data doesn't perform as well as it did on midric validation data on a organizational data. So it allows us to kind of understand uh, how uh, the distribution or difference in data distribution is affecting overall model performance uh, in, a, in a visual and easy to use way. Um, so again, 
uh, this is something I talked about already. Uh, it essentially makes the case that MIDRIC be viewed as uh, ImageNet for medical imaging data, and then federated learning is essentially the framework that you would use to uh, to uh, fine tune or create more robust models. And we can also use MIDRIC to solve a lot of uh, interesting computational problems um, in, in federated learning, allow us to uh, essentially create better algorithms for uh, different federation strategies that allow the overall accuracy of the models. Um, so I put some resources uh, on where you can go and, and use these services and use the, the software framework. Um, the, we, we had a preprint and now it's public uh, now it's pub, uh, published in uh, a, a size special issue on converged computing. Uh, we also innovated on in novel um, aggregation strategies in, in Federation. Um, and that paper got accepted at ICLR. I were quite excited about it. Um, it's an open project, open source for everything. Uh, we're building a community for Federated Learning for Science. Um, please join the community. We have a Discord uh, thing that uh, people seem to like uh, and uh, allow us to interact allow us to interact with developers uh, please take a look at it and um, happy to take any questions and uh, thank you for for your time yes thank you Ravi very much for this uh, very uh, thorough presentation um so I have questions but let's start with questions from the audience since we don't have a lot of time so the first question came in quite early already. It says federated learning is essential and it's being considered for implementation into DICOM, DICOM WG23 on artificial intelligence. Can you provide your opinion on its potential DICOM implementation? I actually didn't know that, uh, that it existed. So I'll take a look at, uh, at the DICOM WG23 on AI. Um, and happy to provide my my opinion once I take a look at it. Sorry, I didn't I didn't know uh, that it existed. <laughs> Sounds interesting. Okay, so the next question is: What kind of network connectivity is required between the sites? So as I mentioned, we we support many different types of uh, uh, connectivity protocols. So um, so. High speed connectivity is, is useful and important um, and, uh, because uh, the models are being transferred over network. So um, a high speed network connectivity is, is imperative for, for better performing models. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Okay. And another question reads, it seems like Epifal, Epifal X frameworks could be used for federated testing. Is this true? What would be the differences or issues for using the frameworks for federated testing? I mean, we it, so it is designed to do federated testing, right? So you know, the output is essentially a model uh, that uh, that um, that is trained on data across multiple sites. So um, model performance becomes the proxy for how your data is uh, at each site. So uh, yeah, so it is. It could be used as is for federated testing. Okay. All right, so uh, last question from the audience so far is that, uh, say, thank you for the presentation. You mentioned observing the data distribution. It might allow us which client yeah. data is different. Does that imply yeah. the framework can analyze global model yeah. weights and based on detect hard to detect cases in overall yeah. data? Yeah, this is my favorite question and, and it's a great one. So, so, <laughs> it, it, so, uh, so we created a, a, a our ICLR paper talks about observing uh, like data distribution across clients and adjusting the aggregation strategies based on that. Um, so we created a general purpose framework called Fed Compass that will allow you to do exactly what you what you're asking. Uh, so that's a, I mean exactly that's a great question. Then that's um, that's why we created a, a framework that allows you to do this uh, more flexible uh, things based on data distribution across clients. Okay, all right. So that, that was the end of the questions uh, from the audience so far. And actually, I'm, I know we're kind of running out of time, but I would like to ask a quick question. So in one of your slides, I think it was slide 20, you had your COVID use case example, where you added more noise and it became more private, more secure. 
But then at some point, there's going to be a degradation, right? There's a trade-off between privacy and per- performance. Do you think yeah. there are ways that you can optimize both like at the same time? Yeah. So I didn't get to talk about this. So so there's a hyperparameter called privacy budget that you, that you add to the training data. Um, and it really... So we did some work on understanding what is the right level of privacy budget for the data modality that you're using. So um, there is definitely a balance and it's not the same for every data modality. So it is an active area of research. Um, We would love to understand, for example, what is the epsilon for chest X-rays? What is the epsilon for CTs? What is epsilon for MRI? So, um, you know, it's a great question. We don't know the answer. Uh, except that it is an, uh, a research question that needs to be uh, understood better. Okay. All right. Well, let's thank uh, Ravi again for this excellent presentation. And I'd like to remind the audience that we have these seminars every uh, third Tuesday of the month. So please join us again next month. And we see you all then. Thank you very much. Thank you all.